guys ready? What, what are we ready for today? Hey, let's, let's get ready to worship with our whole heart, with our whole heart. Speak to your heart and say, heart, I want all of you right now given to the king. I want to open up with Psalm 138 from the Passion Translation. You're welcome to stay seated for now and just let these words cascade over your soul and ignite your soul to praise today. I thank you, Lord, and with all the passion of my heart, not, the, the Lord is not here today to meet half the passion of our hearts. <laughs> he just doesn't mess around like that. He, he's, not, he, he, he's not roaming to and fro throughout the earth looking to play games with Christians. Read the Bible. God is looking for hearts totally consecrated to him. And that's where he shows up with fire and glory. And so today, Lord, we show up to worship you with the passion of our heart. We worship you in the presence of angels. Heaven's mighty ones will hear our voices as we sing loving praise songs to you today. Angels are listening to your praise today. They long to look into your salvation. They admire your salvation. Angels admire your praise. And you know what's fascinating? Angels see God. Angels see the face of God. We don't yet. This is our opportunity to bring God wholehearted praise when we do not yet see. This is the only chance we get here on this side of heaven. And the angels admire that about us, that we can't see God today. And we're showing up choosing to worship him today. And we see him by faith. I bow down before your divine presence and bring you my deepest worship as I experience your tender love and your living truth. For the promises of your word and the fame of your name have been magnified above all else. Yeah, we got something to sing about today. The promises of his word, the fame of his name. At the very moment I called out to you, you answered me. You strengthened me deep within my soul and breathed fresh courage into me. Come on, as you worship today, I pray that every one of you receives fresh courage and a fresh infilling of the spirit today. One day all the kings of the earth will rise to give you thanks when they hear the living words that I have heard you speak. They too will sing of your wonderful ways, for your ineffable glory is great. Your glory is so great, Lord. For though you are lofty and exalted, you stoop to embrace the lowly. Come on, how about that? How about we get, make ourselves low today? You want to be close to the Lord? Make yourself low in his presence. He is very near to those who humble themselves. By your mighty power, we can walk through any devastation, any trouble, and you will keep us alive, reviving us the whole way through. Your power set us free from the hatred of our enemies. You keep every promise you've ever made to us. Since your love for us is constant and endless, we ask you, Lord, to finish every good thing that you've begun in us. Hallelujah. Let's, let's stand and just begin to adore him. someone in here has a shout of praise that needs to explode. If that's you, come on. Release your shout of praise to the Lord. Because you've already won.
You give me beauty for ashes, beauty for ashes. Yes, you do. You give me beauty for ashes, beauty for ashes. You give me beauty for ashes. Oh, you give me beauty for ashes.
to you this morning.
Take me into your glory And make me just like Jesus Show me all the things that you grow 
chance to say you're beautiful. Come on, church, let's love on you. This is my chance to say you're lovely. This is my chance to say you're
just want to give my kids a little bit of freedom to worship Jesus for themselves. Shout your songs of deliverance. You can shout your songs of deliverance. You can shout your songs of deliverance. You can shout your songs of deliverance. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took the breath, when I died in glory, I'm wonderfully made. Will an arms stand apart? I'm can.
Stay with Jesus. Just keep your eyes gazing into his eyes. He wants to tell you how beautiful you are. He wants you to know his reality of you. how much greater it is than your reality of you. And he wants his reality to become your reality. So just look at him. It's just you and him. you, Jesus. We extol you, Jesus. We exalt your holy name. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yes. I love you. This is so beautiful. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John said, Behold the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sin of the world. And as Jesus hung on the cross, and breathed his last breath. He, he cried, it is finished. And the light had overcome the darkness. The veil had been torn and we have been ushered into the throne room, into the presence of God. And we have been clothed with righteousness and restored, restored to Adam. What Adam has lost is now alive. What we were created, the beauty we were created for, we walk in now. Let it be bold enough to say that we are holy in his presence. We are clothed in his righteousness. We can walk in that truth. That truth is our reality if we just believe. Our sins, our mistakes, our missing the marks are as far away as the east is from the west. And by that grace, by that grace we walk and through faith, through faith we live. And he just wants, I looked out today at you guys, he just wants, it's, it's, the, it's the desire of his heart for you to see the way he sees you. He knows how beautiful you are. And it breaks his heart that you don't, that some of you don't. He knows how beautiful you are. He knows what you were created for. He knows how he created you and what you were created for. That's his reality, and that's what he sees. He wants you to lay everything else down that does not align with that truth because it's a lie from the enemy, and it's a fall of man, and it's no longer our reality. So he wants us to believe that when he looks at you, he sees Jesus because we're in Jesus. And how can that not be the most freeing, wonderful thing in the world? Because he exclaimed, this is my son who I am proud of. And he looks at you and he says the exact same thing. This is my daughter. This is my son who I am so proud of. And he loves you. He adores you. And Father, we just give you our hearts. The one thing you desire. The one thing you can't give yourself the one thing you can't give yourself is the yielded, surrendered heart of a free will. And we give that to you, Jesus. We surrender that to you. We lay it down on the altar and say, it's all yours, burn it up, consume it, all consuming fire. Purify us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that we get to boldly come in your presence. We love you. We adore you. We're going to go ahead and take communion at this time. So go ahead and come up with your family. And take the elements back to your seat.
Father, we remember. We remember what you sent Jesus for. Jesus, we remember what you suffered through and why you suffered it. You didn't just suffer. You didn't just suffer so that we could have a savior. So that we could have a life preserver that could pull us up out of the water and then we could hang the life preserver on the wall for the next time we needed it. You suffered so that you could restore us back to what you created us for. You suffered to set the captives free. You suffered to demonstrate how much you love us. And we remember that. And we are so able to see in your word how you gave everything in this new covenant. How you gave all of yourself. How your body was broken and beaten. How your wounds stretched from head to toe. So that you could take all all our brokenness and wounds and heal them through that. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your body that was broken. And we do this in Jesus' name. And we thank you, thank you for the blood of the new covenant that was poured out. We thank you that you didn't hold anything back, that you gave every last drop. And Father, we ask for the grace to do the same. We ask for the grace that in this moment and in these moments, we are proclaiming our covenant back to you where we say we hold nothing back. All that we are is all of yours. We fully give ourselves to you. We come into a oneness with you in this covenant. Let our life be a love offering, just like Jesus's was. Let our life be a blessing to your heart and to the hearts of others, if nothing else. We thank you, Jesus, and we drink this cup and we lay down our lives in remembrance of you. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. All right, beautiful saints. We'll go ahead and bless the children at this time. So if the children want to come forward. Any parents want to come forward and lay hands on, bless the children while we do this, please do. favorite people. Mm -hmm. Bless you all. Father, we thank you. We thank you for these children. They are beautifully and wonderfully made. You created them in your image. You sent Jesus to die for them. You demonstrated your love to each and every one of them, and you call them yours. And Father, we thank you that we get an opportunity to steward them in your love, teach them about your heart for them. And Father, we just pray that their heart is ready to receive, their eyes are able to see, their ears are able to hear, and that they don't just know about you, but they know you. They know you. And Father, I pray for a blessing over their teachers. I pray for an anointing. Holy Spirit, come and speak through them, through these willing vessels that are laying down their lives and their time to be a blessing to these children. We just ask for yeah, protection over their innocence, that you just keep them, that they never turn away from you, 
but they always have their eyes fixed on you and that nothing, nothing from this world can get a grip in them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your wonderful, precious name. Amen. All right, parents, you guys can go ahead and take your kids back. Sign them into Children's Church. And then the rest of us, if we want to take about five minutes to greet one another, get some coffee, water, use the restroom, we'll be right back.
Good morning, beautiful saints. So happy to be with you guys this morning. Uh, during worship, uh, I felt led. It might sound silly, but I felt led to share this with you. Um, I'm here on Wednesdays, and um, I help out with the scheduling stuff for the kids. And um, the lesson, the prayer that we're teaching them this month, it's so good. I actually made a copy and hung it up in the little office that I use, and I wanted to read it to you today. So um, we're having the kids say this out loud. It says, God, thank you for being a real friend to me. Even when I don't see it, I choose to be your real friend. Help me to interact with you in real ways like friends do. Would you show me how to talk to you? And when you talk to me, teach me how to listen to your voice. Amen. That is what we're teaching our kids. I mean, we don't just, obviously, we don't just take for granted, we'll bring in the kids, shove them downstairs. Absolutely not. This is what they're being taught to speak. It's just so awesome. So anyway, yeah, I have this hanging up in my little office, and I read it when I come in. So I thought that I would share. So anyway, welcome, welcome. We're so happy that you're here. If this is your first time, I know you were blessed. I don't have to say I hope you were blessed. But if it is your first time, if you could just raise your hand. We have a gift for you. Um, and uh, inside that... Uh, is a connect card. There's some information about our church and our website that has more information, but there is a little connect card in there. If you could fill that out, we want to get to know for you, get to know you, and pray for you. Uh, there's a little black box in the back where you can drop that off. If you have any prayer requests or anything like that, you can put that on there. And for those of you who do attend regularly, you can fill one of those out also for any um, specific prayer requests. If you're not on the app the Church Center app that I push every week, <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a place in there, too, where you can um, type your prayer requests and um, just know that we have um, a great prayer team that prays. This church is covered in prayer before, during, after service, and all throughout the week. So anyway, we're happy that you're here, and I hope you enjoy the goodies. <laughs> um, on a weekly basis, we have um, prayer, men's and women's prayer. This week we have corporate prayer where we're all together and Pastor's going to fill us in on that. Um, so we would love to see you Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock. Uh, Friday nights we also have a Bible study. It's amazing and don't feel like you're coming in uh, and missing out. We read the chapter together, study the chapter, talk about it. It's an amazing time. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, Paul in the back, wave your hand. You can connect with Paul and Noreen. It's at their home. It's lovely. They open their home every week for us, and it's such a blessing. Um, and then if you want any other information, if you're not on the church app or you can't find it on the website, please feel free to fill out that card also, and then we'll um, get in touch with you and give you any information that you're interested in. Um, on the church app, uh, it's, there's our calendar, our directory, um, different areas of service that you could be involved in, or if you do serve, um, your uh, schedule is in there. Um, and you can also give through the app. So I would like to thank the Lord today. We have the honor and privilege to sow into God's kingdom here. And Zion Church is fertile ground. Last week I talked about gardening. And if you put it in good fertile soil, you're going to have more crops. And this is good fertile soil. It's not just sowing into Zion. We give all over so your seeds are being scattered, just like wildflowers. They're going to pop up in places you never even knew they were going to pop out. So anyway, uh, you can give, again, on the church app. I know I sound like a broken record. <laughs> uh, or you can text to give or uh, put it in the black box in the back. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to give and to sow into what you are doing here at Zion Church throughout the valley and throughout the world, Lord, the nation, things that we sow into. Lord, we sow not just our finances, but our time and our prayers, our energy. God, we just worship you with all that we have. And I bless you for all the faithful givers here at Zion Church. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And welcome back, Pastor Zach and Laura. <laughs>
It's good to be home. Hey, thank you. It's good to be a part of this church. You know, I've been a part of some great churches, but this is my favorite. I think this is the last one for me. You can count on that. <clears throat> so, starting tomorrow or starting today through Wednesday is an invitation to fast and pray. It's not really a command here. It's an invitation. It's an opportunity. And we continue to have this as an open door of opportunity to invite you according to your own faith, according to your own discernment, according to how you hear the Holy Spirit. We invite you to fast and pray for three days. And uh, we've been doing this since day one. I mean, it's been five years. And, and the first three days of the month, we're still humbling ourselves before our God, declaring that he's God and we're not. And we're not too blessed or too comfortable that we have forgotten how to seek him with all of our hearts. And although that is a temptation at times, when, when, when that first Monday of the month comes, there are times I'm like, Lord, I've sown a lot. I think I'm going to chill out for the summer and let other people fast and pray. I think I'm just going to calm down a little bit. And I never hear a response from heaven <laughs> with that line of thinking. Uh, and it's like the Lord says, Zach, it's up to you how much fallow ground you want to break up. It's up to you how much you want to sow. I'm, I'm not going to ever make it a legalistic thing. If you, want to, if you want to be content with the last five years of fasting and praying and never fast again, I'm okay with that as long as you are because you serve me by faith. You serve me not out of a legalistic thing. It's, you know, but the Lord says there's always an invitation to go deeper. There's always more. There's always, there's always an opportunity for you to be broken and contrite before me. And so this upcoming Monday is an invitation to fast and pray, all right? And, and what I think that can look like these three days is as I was praying and just this morning saying, Lord, what am I fasting for? The Lord spoke to my heart and he said, you're fasting to engage in three days of purposeful adoration, and I'm like, hey, we're not fasting for any particular nation or any particular cultural need or person or anything. He said, adore me. Love on me. Consecrate yourself to me in a way in these three days that might be a little different than the rest of your month. And so it's going to be about adoration. And second to that, if there's personal needs that you have, if there's miracles you're praying for, if there's breakthrough you're waiting for, then in your adoration, believe God to meet your need and to come and meet you where you're at for those miracles. All right? I have a list of miracles I'm waiting on. I'm not discouraged at God or frustrated at God until they happen. No, I mean, I rejoice always in the Lord. I give thanks always in every circumstance by prayer and supplication. Present your request to God. And so there's miracles I'm going to be believing for, but... There's a difference. When you come to adore God and just love on him, you can then believe for those miracles out of intimacy and out of abiding and not really have to like wrestle for him and fight for him as if you're hitting on God's chest saying, bless me, I need you, and, and you're getting exhausted. It's like just adore him, get to know him, and realize the Father wants to give you everything you ask for that's in accordance with his will. And a lot of the miracles we are believing for, I know are God's will. I know are God's will, so therefore I can ask in faith with bold confidence before his throne and believe. So in this time of fasting, ask the Holy Spirit, how, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to join in this? How do you want me to participate? Maybe the Holy Spirit says to you, set something aside that's a normal part of your routine for those three days. Don't engage in it. You know, maybe it's food. True fasting is in some, in some way from food. But maybe the Lord says, do a Daniel fast, and you get to enjoy all the cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and green beans and avocado and all the, the vegetables you want. And the Lord sees that, and he honors that, because for you, being a meat eater, he knows you not eating meat is a big deal. And the Lord knows your heart. It's like if someone tithes 50 cents, and it came 
from, the, from generosity, from a deep place of generosity, and someone tithes 100. He sees the same heart, you know? So ask the Lord how he wants you to fast and participate. And I think Wednesday we're going to come together, and we're going to just start with adoration and see what the Lord, just see what happens for an hour and a half or two hours of adoring him. And, and who knows? Maybe we begin to prophesy out of that place. Maybe we begin to... Uh, use the gift of the gifts of the spirit to minister to one another. Maybe we lay hands on one another and pray for healing and strength and restoration. Maybe we we read the word and declare the word of God and and make declarations together over our nation. Who knows what's going to come out of adoration? All right. So it's an invitation to fast and pray three days before we get in the word. Um, and there's and and here let me just say this. If you want to learn more about fasting and prayer and how to do it and what works for your body type and what works for the age that you're at and such and such, the Holy Spirit can give you wisdom for that. If you look up on YouTube, fasting and prayer, guidelines for fasting and prayer, we have a PDF document on our website on zionchurch.com, okay? zionchurchidaho.com. There's a PDF of just some helpful tips. And then there's a message on YouTube, I don't know, a few years ago, fasting and prayer, just some practical things on how to do it. And I'm telling you, it can be some of the best times you have with the Lord. Because what happens is you empty yourself and you, you, you kneel down that morning and you say, Lord, maybe you don't even have faith for it. Maybe you have zero strength for it, but you admit that to him. You get honest with God about that and you confess where you're at. And then you say, help me. I give you my weakness. If that's all I have right now, I give you my weakness. I need your strength. Strengthen me. I consecrate myself to you. I trust myself to you. And I'm telling you, you'll experience miracles. You'll, you, one of the most fascinating miracles I've experienced in times of fasting for a prolonged amount of times is God removing hunger. And like God putting a lock on the door of my gut and shutting it down. And I'm just like, where did my hunger go? This is, God, this is too easy. Day seven, day 21, what is happening here? Like, it's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit so that you know you get no credit from it. God is helping you to humble yourself before his mighty hand so that his hand can bless your life and he can have dominance and control through you and bless people through you. I could say a lot more about that, but I won't. Jennifer, you're here today. Hey, from Africa. Can you come up for a moment? Just... I don't know, take a moment to share an amazing testimony of what Jesus has done before your very eyes and, you know, share a little bit for a few minutes, yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to give God glory for using me as a vessel. Second, I want to thank each of you for your prayers. Um, it was just said that um, when you sow into this house, you're sowing into the nations, and it's true. I'm an example of that, and um, maybe you're not sowing financially, but you sowed in prayer I could definitely feel it. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name's Jennifer. I'm a full-time uh, missionary evangelist. Um, I just returned early. I wasn't supposed to be back until June 20th, but the Lord told me it was time to come home. So I came home on Monday evening. Um, but I was gone for six weeks. I was in Tanzania. I was in Zambia. And I was also in Kenya. And I saw God move in mighty ways, things I hadn't seen before. Um, I saw um, hundreds, of th hundreds of thousands of salvations, one-on-one um, -on -one salvations to crusade salvations, um, where we saw you know, hundreds of thousands of people at a time. But I want to share, um, I'll share three quick testimonies, if that's okay. So the Lord really just uh, was moving on my heart this week about how, um, and I've been trained in crusade evangelism how you can have a crusade, but the people still have to come. But when you go to the people and you take the word to them, that you are doing exactly what it talks about in the Bible, like you're, you're, you're doing the going. And it, it, that doesn't have to be in Africa. It can be here at Albertsons. So I just want to encourage you in that. But um, when I was in Kenya, I was in a very highly Muslim populated area. So when I would meet people one-on-one, -on -one, I would ask them, do you know Jesus as a prophet or as a savior? And they, of course, would say as a prophet. And I would say, well, would you give me a few minutes to let me share with you about the Jesus I know as a savior? And um, two men, Muslim men, which is uncommon, <laughs> 
took the time to let me share with them about Jesus the Savior. And um, they both said no one had ever told them about Jesus the Savior. They only knew about Jesus the prophet. But they both gave their life to Jesus. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one was a young man. And um, his, name was, his name was Salim. And as I was sharing with him, I kept getting this um, word in my head, just worship, worship. And I asked him if he liked music, he liked to write songs. And he said, yes. And how did you know that? And I told him, well, God speaks to you when you have a personal relationship with him. And I said, you know, there's a man in the Bible named David, and he was a worshiper. And he just worshiped the Lord with everything. So I shared with him about that. And he said, I think my name should be David. <laughs> So he told me next time I come to the hotel where he's working that I'll see a new name tag. So um, be praying about that because it would take great courage for him to change his name. So that's um, one incredible testimony. Um, a second testimony is we were in this um, village in Zambia and we were sharing the gospel and um, usually share the gospel, salvation call, and then pray for healing. And even before it started, we had just arrived on the property where we were going to be preaching, and this man was just walking like this, and he literally walked into the area, and he stood up, <laughs> and so just walking into the environment where God was, he was healed, and he came and testified, and healing just broke out in this village, and we saw about, uh, I think it was like 90-some adult salvations and 70-some children's salvations, but healing kept breaking out. They brought, um, this mama handed me a little boy. He was about two and a half. And I felt his legs, and they felt like jello. She said he had never walked before. So I just, like, grabbed his legs, was praying for his legs. Um, and then, like, they went to the side, and I started praying for the next group of people. And then I looked, and I was like, what is happening? But you know how you hold a kid, you know, one person on each side, and you have their hands. He was literally walking. And I said, he'd never walked. They said, no, he never stood on his own. He'd never walked before, and he was walking. And it was just like that day. Um, it was actually my birthday. And it's literally like I lived the book of Acts that day. We saw, um, another, they brought another little boy. After that boy had walked, they said, Auntie, pray for him. And his, his mouth opened. He said, Yesu, which means Jesus. He had never spoken before, and he couldn't hear. And so God was just like, I was like, where are the dead people, right? I was like, it's the only thing, like, we didn't see that day. So that was really um, incredible. And then um, I had the great honor to go and spend um, five days with the Maasai tribe, um, in Masai Mara, and we had this um, evening where men from the tribe came, and we um, they slaughtered a lamb, and they cooked it over the open fire, but um, my friend preached the gospel, and then I preached the gospel, and the pastor said, like, this is an amazing thing. He said, because they won't come to a church, or they won't even sit down one-on-one -on -one with a pastor, but they came because they wanted to see you and they wanted to hear what you had to say. And so though we didn't see any um, visible salvations, like they heard the truth of the gospel twice. So um, I just want to thank all of you for your prayers. Um, that time when I was in the highly Muslim populated area, um, I know that you saints were praying for me and God protected me and my team and we saw um, just incredible things. So um, Thank you, everyone. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for giving your life to Jesus. And if you guys want to sow into the kingdom above and beyond your tithe and give an offering or give offerings, sow into Jennifer and go see what her needs are and just hook it up financially, you know, in, in awesome ways and support her. Um, Thank you, Lord. Ron, thank you for exhorting us in the super abounding love of God last week. Um, I got to enjoy the message on YouTube when I got back, and I was driving around on Wednesday just working in and out and, and putting it on, and I was so blessed. And you're right. If there's one thing I want to super abound in, it's love. I mean, let's get good at that, you know, about... Above and beyond anything else, let's superabound with love. 
And uh, thank you for communicating last week and, and preaching to us and teaching us. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's go. Where are we going? We're going into the Word. First Chronicles 16. You know, I've learned some things about the will of God, and my desire to accelerate the will of God in my life is a genuine desire. Not to take shortcuts, but sometimes to say, God, the quickest way from A to B in your will, help me. Make it happen. And God speaks back, and he says, Zach, you can accelerate my will by learning to adore me. Which is really fascinating, because adoration takes time. It takes significant cost and time and sacrifice, and so it's like I'm trying to accelerate the will of God by taking a step back into my prayer closet and adoring him and learning to worship, but I'm telling you, this, this is a spiritual truth I want to talk about today that many of you are probably already aware of, so let it be a reminder, and if this is new to you, let this take you deeper into your relationship with God, but learning to adore Jesus ought to be at the top of your list of things to become good at in life. You know, there's certain things that just do not come with an owner's manual, like marriage. A lot of us are just kind of left to figure that out. And as we try to figure it out, it gets really hard and messy, and we're crying out to God and saying, why didn't you leave me a manual? Well, he did, and in certain ways, you can collect your own owner's manual to figure out what it's like to be married and how to thrive in marriage. And um, another thing that we have, we actually have a guide for, an owner's manual for, is adoration, how to worship God. And a lot of the lessons we learn from worship come from the Old Testament, from David's life, because David was a worshiper. And so we're going to read some verses out of First Chronicles 16, verses 8 through 12, and then we're going to skip a few, and we're going to go into verses 29 through 30. All right, so First Chronicles 16, will you stand with me while we read out of the ESV? 1 Chronicles 16, verses 8 through 12, and verses 29 through 30. Verse 8. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. And let me just interrupt real quick. If, if you ever want to make a list of all that's in these verses, all the verbs of the action that you can take in your relationship with God in worship, it's really awesome to make a list of what you can do here. Make known his deeds among the people. Verse 9, sing to him. Come on, it's not a requirement to have a good voice. God doesn't care about that. Amen. Sing to him. You were born to sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. You are called to open your mouth and to not be shy about what God has done. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord be depressed. Does it say that? Oh, this whole Christian thing, this whole seeking the Lord thing, this whole monastic fasting prayer thing, this is depressing, this is hard. No, it says those who seek the Lord rejoice. Those who seek the Lord, I would say, are extremely happy, are very happy. Those who seek the Lord are actually having fun. Those who seek the Lord are having more fun than waiting in line at Disneyland for the new Star Wars ride. Like, There's more thrill and euphoria in seeking the Lord than generating all the wealth you can think you can have. So seek the Lord and rejoice. 11, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Seek his presence continually. Are you ever allowed to turn off your seeking according to the word of God? Verse 12. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. If in your seeking you find yourself shutting down or getting lazy, one key to reigniting your seeking is to remember what he has done, and you'll feel fuel rushing into your soul to seek him again. Amen. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Verse 12, remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. 29, ascribe to the Lord, the glory that is due his name. There is glory that's due to him. Bring an offering and come before him. 
Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. I love a couple things in there. Tremble. How about we learn to tremble before the Lord? How about we learn to tremble before the Lord? How about we learn to shake in worship because we're so overwhelmed with reverence? The splendor of his holiness. Bring an offering to him. One thing he said to the Israelites is he said, I don't want your garments, I want your heart. Don't rend your garments. Don't come and act like you're repentant and just tear your cloak. I don't want a torn cloak. I want your heart. Tear your heart open and worship me. Tremble before me. You may be seated in Jesus' name. These verses take place within the context of David bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. You want to read some awesome stuff about worship? Go into First and Second Chronicles. This is just after David brought the ark back and really got serious and organized about worship. And worship is not always this spontaneous thing, this freelance thing that just kind of comes and goes and I'll worship when I feel it. Worship is a very intentional, organized, purposeful thing in the life of a believer. You are supposed to strategize your worship to God. You are supposed to learn how to worship God in the valley of discomfort and on the mountaintops of blessing. And this is a time in David's life where he, he built a shelter, I think it was a tent, for the ark. The Lord said, you're not going to build me a house. Your son will. Go ahead and build your house. Put the ark here. And, and David got seriously organized with worship. And not only with worship, but with adoration. There's a difference. With adoration. And during this time, David instituted 24-7 praise and adoration at the ark. So that's church. That's church without a stage and without lights and without fog machines and without all these entertaining songs. They didn't always have songs. You know what they did? They got before the ark and they gave thanks and they groaned and they shouted the victories of the Lord. And they, they gave the Lord their heart and spontaneously and prophetically worship would come out of that place and songs would be written from that place. It wasn't about having a number one hit or doing the music industry thing. It was about giving your heart at the altar. And this, was, this is what church looked like in David's day. Coming to the altar and worshiping God 24-7. We might not do it here right now at Zion. Our doors might not be open 24-7. But you are a living, breathing, functioning, living Christian. And you are supposed to 24-7 live and move and have your being in him in worship. In adoration. It's one thing I'm continuing to learn as a Christian. Lord, how can I adore you in this situation? How can I adore you in this meeting with this person? How can I adore you at this time of day? All right? Are you guys okay with me being vulnerable with you? All right. So when we started this church, man, I was seeking God, and I had a minimum of two hours like every morning seeking him, getting up, and I had a vibrancy, and I had a zeal to wake up and be with the Lord. Since my son Arrow has been born, and my wife and I have been through a lot, I have been trying to fight to get that zeal again to wake up, and I'm telling you guys, I've been getting some real good sleep, and it's dangerous. It's dangerous. I'm like, Lord, don't let me get this good of sleep because my alarm's going off, and I'm sitting there. I'm laying there like a boulder. I can't get my eyes off. I'm like, Lord, what, what has happened to my strategic plan to get up and adore you? Because that's where all my strength comes from. And so right now, I'm being honest with the Lord. I'm saying, Holy Spirit, what happened? Don't let me just make excuses and say, oh, I've been through this, and my son was born, and there's a new routine, and I just, you know, and be okay with that. I'm saying, no, Holy Spirit, show me. How do I get that fresh, vibrant zeal back? to get good sleep and to sleep like a log and to get up with fire and zeal my bones to go seek the Lord. So I'm being vulnerable with you about that. I'm asking the Lord to take me back into a solid time of consistent adoration because it's important. All the strength I've experienced as a Christian has come from worship. That's where it comes from. I want to talk to you just about a, a couple things we learn about advancing the kingdom. And we learn this from David's life, from the Old Testament, just two things as an introduction here real quick. Number one, at the heart of David's administration was the profound culture of worship. David's name has gone down as one of the 
best leaders in history. Jewish history or non-Jewish history. Matter of fact, I consider him the best leader in history. And at the center of David's administration was worship. This guy, before he went out and slayed the enemies of God, he would allow his heart to be slain in the presence of his king. And he knew where his strength came from. And he was unashamed of it. So, so adoration advances the kingdom, kingdom. And we see at the heart of David's administration was the culture of worship. First Chronicles 13, 8. And David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might. Listen. The whole nation of Israel under the leadership of David were celebrating constantly with all their might with song and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. You don't have to agree with me on this, but music and instruments were instituted and created for worship. And anytime they're used outside of worship, they get perverted. And they open the door for wrong spirits to influence the heart of people. Music was created to adore God. Period. Period. I can support that with scripture. I can also support that in the fact that when we get to heaven, every instrument will be used for one thing, worship. And so they made instruments to worship. Notice, with all their might, they worshiped. Therefore, with God's might, they defeated the enemy. You want all of God's might in your life? Then how about you worship him with all of your might? Maybe you're weak because your worship is weak. I'm saying that to myself. Hey, listen. Since Tuesday, I've been preaching this sermon to myself before I ever opened my mouth to preach it to you. Maybe at times in our life when we're weak and dry, it's because our worship is weak and dry. we got to get it reignited. That's where our strength comes from. Listen to this. 1 Chronicles 16.4. Then he appointed. See, that's leadership. He appointed the Levites, some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. In Christ, every one of you is a Levite. You have been appointed, not by David, by Jesus. Jesus called you and appointed you and said, now you are a worshiper. You're all worshipers. The extent of victory in David's life was in proportion to the consistency and the sincerity of his worship. The extent of victory... In David's life was in proportion to the consistency, that's regularity, and sincerity of his worship. You know, if there's, here's what I do. If there's ever times I'm trying to worship the Lord and I just know it's not feeling sincere and I'm just kind of singing through a song, I stop and I say, Jesus, help me, please. I don't want to just sing through these lyrics with you. Please come. Please come. Reignite my heart to be genuine, to sing. And you know what? He always honors that request. It, and it might be he'll show me something that got out of frequency or out of tune or off track. And he'll say, hey, that little thing, boom, okay, I'm sorry. I repent. Clean me. Wash me. And it's so simple. He wants to build within you and empower within you genuine worship because he knows genuine worship brings transformation. There's a lot of songs being sung in churches and zero power, zero transformation for Christian living. So what's the problem? Well, there's a big problem. It's not genuine. It's not genuine. Who cares about just getting through three songs? Let's pour our hearts out before the king. Who, who cares if I give my kids a little bit of freedom on their instrument to praise the Lord and it turns out to be really sounding bad? I don't care. I'm giving them an opportunity to be wholehearted and to engage in their own personal worship of Jesus because it's worth teaching. I tell my kids, it doesn't all have to sound good up here today, but you do need to worship with all your heart. You do need to have fun with Jesus. Because guess what? Your dad don't always sound good when he worships. The other day, my daughter tells me, when you're leading worship, Dad, you yell a lot. They were giving me some correction. You know, for me, it's a little, it kind of hurts my heart a little bit because I had a terrible voice growing up. And then, you know, I was like, I'm getting all the in sync and Backstreet Boy albums I can get. I'm going to learn every song. Uh, hey, I wasn't a Christian yet. Okay, I wasn't a Christian yet. So I was really into the boy bands, all right? 
And man, I'd sing those boy band songs like with all my heart. My mom would be like, turn that down. You're terrible. Shut the door. I, I was not born with a voice. I was born with a desire to sing a song that I had not yet discovered. And so because I didn't know who I was, I listened to NSYNC and Backstreet Boys sing about stupid, stupid, lesser love type things. That's all I knew. But I sang and I sang and I said, I said, Mom, I'm joining choir. She was like, <laughs> join shop class, learn carpentry, join mechanics, you know. But one day I was in there with my karaoke machine. It's tearing up my heart when I'm with you. See, yeah, yeah. When we are apart, I feel it too. And no matter what I do, I Please forgive me today. I just feel really free with my father. And I might offend some people. But I was singing, and my mom opens the door and said, where did your voice come from? And it just kind of got a little better one day, and it was just there. I had to work on it. And I went to choir, and my choir teacher taught me, hey, your voice is a very precious muscle. Your voice needs to be exercised. Before you just jump into a song, let me teach you vocal warm-ups. Let me teach you exercise. Let me teach you how to warm that thing up to where it can be at its best. And I learned a whole lot in choir. And the thing is, I'm getting all back to what my daughter said. I used to do a lot of vocal warm-ups and sing all this opera stuff and whatever. And then I became a Christian, and uh, I've ruined my voice a lot. <laughs> So I'm just like, God, I just, I don't have time to warm up. Yeah! I just want to sing. And so, so, I don't warm up anymore. And that's why it sounds like I'm yelling and my voice is not what it could be. Because this is an altar. I'm not here to perform. And that gives you permission as you come to this church you don't have to perform. You get to lift your voice and shout unto the Lord and praise him and worship him and, and sing songs to him that are so much better than you too and Backstreet Boys and whatever because you're singing to the one who made you in your mother's womb. It, it's, it's what all music comes down to, worship. It's what it's all there for. Hopefully that landed somewhere. I forgot where I'm at in my sermon. <laughs> David and the Israelites' vertical relationship with Yahweh came before all horizontal relationships. Before they experienced victory over the enemy, they experienced victory over self. Before the Lord could slay the enemies of Israel, he had to slay Israel herself so that they always depended on him in an atmosphere of worship and praise. And then the Lord could say things like, watch how, watch how many of your enemies I will drive back for your sake because you have made my heart your priority. So at the heart of David's administration was the profound culture of worship. What do we have up there right now? Worship was also the lead weapon in battle. I don't know what battle you're in, but worship. I don't know what you're facing right now, but make it priority to adore Jesus in the midst of your battle. Second Chronicles 20, 21. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. So the Levites would lead with a song before a sword was ever drawn. Giving thanks is often empowered in situations where it apparently looks as though there's nothing to give thanks about. You're not thanking God for the warfare. You're thanking God for who he is and what he can do in the midst of the warfare. This is what the Lord reminds me of. He says, Zach, when you get to heaven, it's all going to be a piece of cake and really easy to worship me. This is the only chance you get to stir yourself up and adore me when things are uncomfortable. This is the only chance you get in this life. So why don't we learn to strengthen ourselves in the Lord and adore him when things are troublesome, when things are uncomfortable, when we're up against mountains, we don't know how we're going to get around or get over or get through. Why don't we learn to adore and to praise him when it's hard? 
Heaven's when we retire, guys. Heaven's, heaven's the vacation we never come, have to come home from again. It's celestial bliss and progress in the very presence and glory of God for the rest of eternity. And there's nothing hard there. There's nothing bad there. There's nothing ugly there. How about we give it our all and learn to adore him right now? When Laura got sick and I was driving to Murray, Utah after just everything just felt like, and some of you will know what I mean, it just feels like hell is overwhelming your life instead of heaven. And I felt the very presence of the angel of death staring me down, trying to take my wife. And, and as I was making that drive, I was like, Lord, what's the game plan? And he said, all the strength you need is in adoration. And I'm thinking, how do I adore God when my wife is got 3% left of her heart strength and she's practically dead? And the Lord tells me again, adore me. I'm telling you, I had a four and a half hour drive to Murray, Utah that I could not get through unless I was worshiping. Four and a half hours away from my wife, she had just got life flighted from St. Luke's to Intermountain Health Clinic. And I, and I was like this far from her, and it's like that four and a half hours was so uncomfortable. And the Lord said, the only way you're going to get through this time is by worshiping me, adoring me. Interesting, Laura, Laura and I were watching recently on our vacation a little documentary on the History Channel laying in bed in the hotel after we got Arrow to bed, and we're just flipping through the channels. I'm like, Holy Spirit, give me something good. I come onto the History Channel, and there's a documentary on FDR and World War II and how he handled the Great Depression all this stuff. Just very fascinating, well-done documentary. And they, they, they talked about the first, team, first time that Roosevelt and Churchill came together in their partnership. They came together on a battleship in the Pacific Ocean, and you know what they did at the end of their meeting? This, I, I never knew this. Many of you might have known this. But you know what they did on that battleship with all the soldiers and them standing side by side? They opened up their hymnals. And before they engaged with any battle with Hitler and, and all this bad stuff, they sang hymns. Yes. Their first meeting. Their first meeting, they stood on that battleship and they sang to God. And at that time, America was rated way down on the scale of having the strongest military compared to Germany and others. America was way down here. America was weak. I think America had like 500 plant, uh, jets that were going up against 5,000 German jets. And all the ratios were off, and America was weak. But you know what America did? You know what Roosevelt did? You know what Churchill did? They opened up their hymns out there in the Pacific Ocean on their battleship, and they said, Jesus, we sing to you. We need you. We have no battle to win if you're not with us. And they both knew God was with them. And so they sang. Weeks later, months later, years later, whatever, they broke through German walls in Normandy that nobody thought they could get through. And they all knew it was an act of God. And obviously the hero, heroism of many thousands of people. But that fascinated me. I watched that part of the episode and I cried. I'm like, oh my God, those two leaders, unashamedly, unapologetically, opened their hymns and worshiped. And they won. They won World War II. They partnered with God. There was sacrifice. There was pain. There was hurt. But they, they knew where their strength came from. Amen. Oh, there's so much I want to say and pray over our nation right now in that context. But you know, let's pray for our nation this week as we adore God. Pray that our nation comes back to adoration. Number two, the definition of adoration. Adoration is just deep love and respect for God. Adoration is awe and wonder. Adoration is different from worship because you're not just singing songs. Your heart is actually in awe. You're actually in wonder. Adoration is veneration. Veneration means reverence. I'm actually committed to worshiping God because I fear Him. How about we say that over ourselves? I'm committed... To worshiping God because I fear Him. That's awe and wonder. That's adoration. The portion of holy fear 
in the Lord you possess will determine the portion of divine wisdom you carry for life. How do we get wisdom? Well, we ask for it. But how do we get into a position where we ask for wisdom and receive it? We position our lives to fear God, to be in awe and wonder of him. We had an electrical problem on our job the other day. And the electrician was out of town. It's something he couldn't come address. And I do some electrical, but it, you know, it hits a dead end at some point, and I got to get the pro in there. And so I went over to the job, and, and one of our employees we have working for us is a profess, uh, professing um, not atheist, but pagan, professing, very intellectual pagan. And we get into some fun conversations, but I try to bring up Jesus whenever I can, all right? So I'm in there troubleshooting this electrical deal, and he's out there working on a, a doorknob, and I get the problem fixed, you know, with about, in about 25 minutes that we couldn't figure out. And he's like, what did you do? And I said, I asked Jesus yes. for help. Amen. And he's like, oh, my gosh, give me a break. I said, ask Jesus to show me the problem. I'm serious. Why? Because I fear him in that I know he has the answer and I respect his wisdom. And I could goof around with this electrical issue for an hour or I could just humble myself real quick and say, Jesus, show me the problem and in 30 minutes have it fixed. At the risk of looking stupid in front of someone who thinks Jesus was a nobody. But it's like, hey, I'm unashamed of where I get all my help. All my help comes from him. It's like, I, I am nothing special. Jesus is special. And Jesus is in me. Jesus is in you. He's the hope of glory. Therefore, glory is in your life because Jesus is in you. Yes. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. All the wisdom and insight you need is in adoring God. I've put this to the test. I'm continuing to learn how to live this. If you prioritize worship and adore God, you will have the wisdom and insight you need for life. Number three, God does not sympathize with a lack of adoration. This is encouraging. Hear me out on this. God does not sympathize with a lack of adoration. Every time in my life I've made an excuse for missing out on adoring God, I've gotten no sympathy from it. God continually reminds me he's a jealous lover and he's worthy of adoration. He's worthy of all my attention. He's worthy of all your attention. Here's the thing about God. God is not self-conscious. God does not need our worship. God is not self-conscious, he's self-aware, and he knows he's holy, he knows he's the source of all life, and that means he knows we need him because we are his creation. He made us, we did not make God. I love the lyrics of that Rich Mullins song. Uh, I did not make it, no, it is making me. It is the very truth of God, not the invention of any man. The fact that we don't just have a religion that we crafted, or made. We have a God who made us. And that's what works. That's what, that's what makes the difference in our transformation is we follow a God whom we do not control, whom we did not make. We see this in that when the Israelites were few in number and when we are few in number, the means to greatness is to join ourselves to Yahweh's strength through praise. If you want a scriptural reference for this, 1 Chronicles 16, 19 through 22, the Israelites were few in number. And the word of God says of David, he gave him victory wherever he went. And he was fewer in number than the Amorites and the Philistines. And the list goes on. Adoration is complete dependence upon God constantly. So depending upon the battle you're in, if you're aware of the fact that you are in constant warfare, you will make it a priority to adore God and not make excuses for a lack of adoration because you know the warfare you're in. You know, you know you're in the now and the not yet. You know the weapons we fight with are not carnal or physical. The weapons we fight with are spiritual. And you want to tap into those weapons, you get into your secret place and you learn to adore him. You're running empty on love. You're running empty on mercy. You're running empty on forgiveness. Go get in your secret place and adore God for 15 minutes. Matter of fact, adore him for five minutes. Matter of fact, adore him for 60 seconds and see what he can replenish and fill you with in 60 seconds. It's amazing. 
Talk about grace. Sometimes the Lord said, Zach, I know you don't have an hour. Give me 60 seconds. Boom, 60 seconds, I get filled. I'm like, Lord, that's a lot of mercy. You have such great mercy on me. I didn't have an hour to give you today. 60 seconds. Are we okay? Is any of this good? Proverbs 3, 7 through 8. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. We notice a very mighty truth in our text, verse 11 of our text. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. We are supposed to be seeking him continually. The Lord, his strength, his presence. Seeking his face. Psalm 28 has this phrase, my heart will seek your face. That's a good summary of what the Christian life should be like. Someone who's seeking the face of God. That's Christianity. That's the life of a believer. That, that's what the remnant in the body of Christ is to be defined by. They are people seeking the face of God. When I first met God at the age of 17, when I was born again, I instinctively knew. Nobody had to tell me this. I knew when I became born again at the age of 17 that this encounter was very different than anything else I had experienced in life. This encounter demanded the rest of my life in total loyalty without compromise. Jesus doesn't just become a part of your life. He becomes the whole of your life. And once you give him all of yourself, you begin to experience in Christ all things are holding together. And you begin to experience a divine strength that far exceeds what you could produce by your own merit. And it comes by a lifestyle of adoration. Jesus never said he was religion. He said he was Lord. Religion demands part of you. Religion tells you it's okay for you to come and look a certain way on Sunday and Wednesday and then to go goof around and do your thing the rest of the week. Religion's okay with that. Jesus said, I'm not religion, I'm Lord. You do the math. You fill in the rest of that equation. Jesus says, I'm Lord. I deserve everything. I deserve your full commitment every day of the week for the rest of the of your life. Matter of fact, make a choice, either be hot or cold. I've prayed for you. I've made you to be hot. I've made you to have my zeal in your bones. I've made you to be not toned down or turned down in any other way or have any other snare inside of you because I'm Lord, I deserve all. Therefore, I'm gonna help you produce all back to me. Take refuge in that. Don't get discouraged by this. Know that the Lord is interceding for you at the right hand of the Father prophesying, declaring, believing, empowering your destiny to be fully committed to him. And anything less of that, he's not interceding for. He's on your side, the cloud of witnesses. I remember when I was preaching the gospel in our home when we started this church, the Lord warned me. He said, I'm going to destroy your ego really quick because you cannot be in ministry with your ego competing. If you have your ego intact, you will be in this for nine months and quit. So what the Lord did to destroy my ego is one Sunday there'd be a lot of people, and the next Sunday there'd be one person. And the Lord would tell me, preach your heart out. And I'd say, well, there's one person here. And I'd negotiate with God, and like, do I need to give it my all? You know, there's maybe five more, and God, God said, there's one person here and a myriad cloud of witnesses Wanting to hear what you have to say about your salvation because they peer into it. They long to look into it. The angels are fascinated by what the work of the cross is doing inside of you. And if you just goof around and tone it down and get your ego in the way, the angels are not longing to back that up. They're not longing to get behind that. The angels are longing to hear the genuine profession of your salvation. It's not just one person sitting here. Ego can last for a little while. Ego can preach if there's a thousand people in the room. Ego can look real good on YouTube, get hits, whatever. But then there's this whole deeper revelation that comes to you as a Christian when you realize 
There's a cloud of witnesses watching your life right now who admire the work of the Holy Spirit in you, who are longing to see the next manifestation of Jesus through you, whether nobody's watching or everybody's watching. Wholehearted worship, wholehearted commitment because he's Lord. And no matter what the call looks like, whether you're in Africa, working in the dirt, doing some really humble stuff nobody else has seen, or you're in front of a huge whatever, just make sure he's Lord and he has all your heart. The Reset by Jeremy Riddle. A paragraph on wholehearted worship from Jeremy Riddle, one of my favorite worshipers. When it comes to worship, becoming wholehearted is everything. God has never been interested in anything less than our whole hearts, and he is worthy of nothing less than our undivided love. He's a jealous God. He refuses to share his people with other gods. Thank God that he's not okay with sharing you. He exclusively belongs to you. He made a commitment to you that was undistracted and very determined. So determined that he humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross so that he could win you. He is exclusively, jealously consecrated to you. How can a holy God consecrate himself to an unholy person? The cross. The cross bridges that gap. He is undivided in his devotion to you. How about we believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can give that back to him. He is the God who makes covenant with his people. He is not idolatrous or polygamous. God does not commit adultery on you. He is faithful, loyal, and true, and fiercely desires a people, just as the apostle Peter wrote, for his own possession, a wholehearted, holy, devoted people. That's why I think this is my favorite church. I believe we're tasting this. I believe we are a people and we're becoming a people who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. And it's a, it's a privilege to be a part of. It's a privilege to be a part of. Thank you. You knew. I was looking at my watch, but I wear this watch for looks. I don't actually wear a watch to be governed by time. I I don't like time. Time is going by too fast for me in life right now. I try to capture a moment, and the moment is gone. I'm like, hey, hey, don't get away from me. Let me hold on to you. Thank you. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Number four, what a lifestyle of adoration looks like. I might just read some of this. Number one, it's without time restraints. How fascinating is that? Well, maybe it's time for you to wear a watch that's just for looks, all right? (laughs) Being in love with Jesus takes time. His heart is vast and deep. Our exploration of him will require the rest of our lives. It will require eternity. I mean, that's, that's one of the virtues or the characteristics of this house is that we are learning to worship him in a way that's not restricted by time because we want to engage with Jesus here. We want to engage with Jesus here. He has depths in his heart that are worthy to be explored. If I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to know and understand the depths of my wife's heart, who's a creation of him, How much more so are there depths in his heart as maker that I'm going to try to be exploring in worship? And you too. So without time restraints. Number two, a lifestyle of adoration pushes beyond dignity. Does anyone else's opinion matter when it comes to how much you love Jesus or what they think about it or how it made them feel? Does it really matter? Don't allow the conservative branch to sap the fruitfulness from the free branch. Don't allow the conservative branch to sap the fruitfulness from the free branch. This is one of the first things that happen, happens when you get free from dignity. 
and you begin to have pure, undefiled worship before God that is undignified. The first thing that will happen is that some conservative Christians will come along the way and tell you you're a little bit out of line. Calm down. Your church is not for me. I'm just a little more of a conservative Christian. I'm like, well, have that conversation with God. Was God conservative in demonstrating his love for you? If he was, then be a conservative Christian. But if he was unrestrained and his love was unrestricted and he gave it all on that cross, then maybe your worship should start looking less like a denomination and more like an undignified remnant of the bride praising her bridegroom. Radical love for Jesus simply means you've rightly perceived how much he's loved you and forgiven you. Luke 7, 47, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has forgiven little loves little. This is my question. He who's been forgiven little loves little. Have any of you been forgiven little? Do any of us have an excuse before the throne to love God little? Let's get over ourselves. Then why hold back? Number three, under what a lifestyle of adoration looks like. Number three, adoration magnifies who the Lord is rather than what the situation is. The cave of Adullam for David became a holy place only because he chose to praise in that cave instead of complain and give up in that cave. If he complained and gave up in that cave, it would have just been a cave. But the Lord made that cave into a holy place. And the Lord, in the lyrics of Brandon Lake's song, Closer or something like that, it says, you've turned this cave into a holy place and you don't let a tear of mine hit the ground. Because perspective is attained through praise and David saw way more than just a cave. David saw a place where the Lord could inhabit his praise regardless of the geography of where he was. Divine adjustment comes by adoration. If you need a new perspective on something, if you're growing weary, if you're worn out, if you're overwhelmed by defeat, you need a new perspective. You need to get caught up into the third heaven by adoration again. And the Lord will remind you what he can do. It's often in our moments of warfare that we find our adoration turning from fluff to sincere praise. And we say, oh, there it is. There's my song. What the enemy meant against me has only refined and fueled my adoration. I remember one time I was in this really run-down hotel in this Red Lion cheap, cheap hotel room. And I'm just sitting in there thinking, I don't even know what's happened in this room. But I feel dirty being in this room. And the Lord said, make it a holy place. Get out your Bible. Turn on the praise music. Worship me. And in this little rundown hotel room, I started worshiping God, and God turned that little red lion hotel room into a holy, holy, holy place. Matter of fact, I encountered God so beautifully that I, I stepped back as I left that hotel room. I took a picture of the stained, tattered chair that I was sitting in praising, and I keep it in my photos to remember, remember that God met me in a very ugly, podunk little place. And he made that place holy. How many of you he's done that for? You know what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter what it looks like around you. Turn on your praise. Turn on your adoration. Watch the Lord make it holy. I won't read all this. I'm thinking about the kids now and the teachers hanging on. 2 Corinthians 10.4, the weapons you fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Romans 5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. How about you let these things define who you are regardless of what position you're in, regardless of what room you're in, regardless of how ugly or or troublesome a situation looks like. Let the nature of God remind you who you are in that place. Number five, resisting the enemy is falling in love with Jesus. You guys okay with five more minutes? I can get done in five minutes. Matter of fact, yeah. Oh, cool, there you go. You're ahead of me. Let's get it done. (laughs) 
Resisting the enemy is this easy. It's falling in love with Jesus. A lethal blow to the enemy's camp is falling in love with Jesus. It's not enough to believe. We can have one foot in the enemy's camp all day long and one foot in the kingdom of God and still never really resemble Jesus. It takes both feet firmly planted, a heart that's all in. You know, there's this phrase in Psalm 68, verse 1. It says, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Thank you for the timer. I'm going. Just kidding. So there's a phrase in Psalm 68, 1. Let God be exalted. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. What the Lord has shown me about that is when you're surrounded by enemies, how is God exalted? He's exalted through you. He's exalted through your declaration. He's exalted through what you believe in the midst of being surrounded by your enemies. He's exalted by you professing who he is rather than be intimidated by your enemies. And here's what happens. You're surrounded by your enemies and you begin exalting him. And in exalting him, he begins to scatter your enemies. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. I, I don't know about you. But when I come here to worship on Sunday mornings, I got enemies. I have enemies. I have demons chasing my tail with certain temptations, and I don't have time to play around. I have to get down to business exalting God because I've got enemies he has to scatter on my behalf so I can walk in purity and dominion with the Lord. You do too. Matter of fact, it could be a blessing for the Lord to reveal to you how many enemies, how many demons of religion and whatever temptation are hunting you down so that you can look behind you for a moment and say, oh, wow, I need to exalt the Lord. I got enemies that need to be scattered. Six, all in adoration produces character and witness. Our text tells us, make his deeds known among the people to sing to him and tell of his glorious works. Adoration should result in witness. That is the key to evangelism. Adoring him, getting overwhelmed by his love, and going out and not being able to contain it and telling others about him. <clears throat> Who we worship determines the choices we make. We are to open up our mouths to others, and this is in terms of evangelism. We are to open our mouths to others only after opening our heart to the Lord first. Wow. I like to think of it this way. The only way I have permission to run my mouth is if I'm running to him. Because then when I open my mouth, humility oils my words, and I've been with him. And I'm speaking from his presence. You know? I asked myself the question the other day, Lord, how do I sanctify my wife through the washing and, and renewing of the word? How do I preach to her? The Lord said, don't use your mouth. I said, what are you talking about? That's how everybody interprets the scripture. The Lord said, no, let my word have its way in you. So much so that where you stop using your mouth and you let my word be demonstrated through your life, that's how you sanctify and wash your wife with my word, without using your mouth. I was like, that sounds hard. <laughs> I'd rather just open my mouth and tell it like it is. Lord said, keep doing it that way. See what happens. Laura, you all right? <laughs> Forgive me. You knew when you got into this with me, I wasn't going to hide anything. My wife's an amazing wife. I love her very much. I love her. Matter of fact, she washes me with the word. I get off track one bit. Here it comes. My wife's giving me a sermon. Thank you, Jesus. All right. All right. I'm not going to get through all this. Just a note, you know, number seven, the content of your adoration. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit about the type of worship that you should feed your secret place with because not all the Christian music out there is about him. Make sure the worship glorifies him and doesn't glorify the self-life. Yeah. Be choosy and discerning about the lyrics. And you know what? It's okay if verse one is about you as long as in the chorus it gets to being about him. And then in verse two, it's about him. And in the bridge, it's about him. Okay, it's okay to sing, I was a sinner and this and that, and I got, you know, whatever. But make sure it gets to glorifying him. Worship and music that glorifies him is transformative.
Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 says about himself, I was caught up to the third heaven. How about we remind ourselves just in this last couple sentences. My challenge to you and to myself is that through adoration, we would get caught up to the third heaven more and more and more often and to live from the position of the third heaven influence. This view from the third heaven in adoration is explosive with splendor and the angle is glorious and you can have it by faith right where you're at through surrender. Let's stand and pray. Hey, Jennifer, would you be willing to participate in praying for people today at the altar, or do you have to leave right away? And, uh, yeah, our other, our other prayer counselors can come to the front, too. And uh, if you need healing in your body today and you want to be prayed for, we'd love to pray for you, and we'd love to believe on God's behalf and on your behalf to be set free from any and all infirmity and to pray for healing. And if you want to just be prayed for and encouraged and ignited in your faith as a Christian to adore God, come up and receive prayer. I'm going to pray a general prayer over all of us, but if you just want one-on-one ministry, please come up and receive prayer today. Father, I thank you for how much you mean to us in this place. I thank you that you are teaching us and you are showing us what it looks like to adore you in this house. And Father, one thing I've heard you say many times is that your eyes are looking back and forth throughout the earth looking for genuine hearts that are bent towards you, that are looking for you, that are seeking you. And I pray and I declare and I believe and I prophesy over this house, over Zion, that Zion is your home. It's one of your homes. It's one of the places you love to dwell. It's one of the places you love to walk into and show off the train of your robe and extend your arms and receive all of the adoration that is getting poured out like an alabaster jar getting broken open at this altar of people who are not just needy in the sense of coming to you and saying, God, I need this. God, help me with this. God, 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 this, this, this. We come with the agenda to first and foremost adore you and love you for what you did on our behalf at that cross and so father i bless these people i bless these saints in this house may you continue to fuel and reinvigorate every soul in this room to worship you with all their hearts and i thank you i get to be a part of such a great company of believers who love you we love you We praise you in Jesus' name today. Hallelujah. Amen. Bless you this week. See you on Wednesday night.